Well, good morning, church. So good to see you. What a great day it is to be in the house of God, isn't it? Such a precious time. So appreciate just the sense of God's nowness and his, uh, his presence here. It just ministers to me so much. And um, I'm just grateful for you. I don't tell you this. I tell it to you briefly sometimes, but I want you to know something. I love you. And I'm so grateful that I get to do what I get to do here to serve you with God's word. So please hear my heart today. Uh, I almost sang, have I told you lately that I, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, did you guys like that? That was nice, huh? Good, huh? <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much. So appreciate that. Um, guys, listen, really excited. Um, this is the last part of the series, but, uh, but really next week is also a, an installment of it. And uh, we're going to have a special guest next week. And his name is Dr. Joe Boot. And uh, I've been aware of Dr. Joe Boot for a while. I have a couple of his books, but he leads the Ezra Institution, um, or sorry, Ezra Institute of Cultural Reformation. And God's really um, called Dr. Joe Boot to help equip the body of Christ of what it looks like to live out your faith in culture. And this is one of the things that, that pastors are called to do is they equip the saints, the believers, to go and be a light and be salt and apply God's word in every aspect and area of our culture and of our life. And so, and so God has really gifted him at teaching and leading people. And so he's going to be here. He's going to be uh, sharing next week. And so just want to show you this quick video, some clips of him, and uh, so you can prepare to have a great time next week with him. Every social order, whether it's Christian, Islamic, Hindu, secular, pagan, because every, every social order is governed by a God, God concept and therefore an idea of sovereignty. And Psalm 2, of course, means that in education, in law, in political life, in economics, that invaded our institutions and basically de-Christianized them. But you know, if you keep politics out of the pulpit, all you end up with is a politicized church. If you're not having to ever follow Christ's example of facing uh, a marginalization, persecution, and so on, are we actually proclaiming Christ, making Christ known, living the Christian life? Are we truly Christian? It will be very challenging to you. But it's a new perspective, and um, if, if don't, don't cast any conclusions yet. Let me invite you to come back and listen to his heart and how he sees the Great Commission, how it is to be worked in every area of our lives. Um, this is what we need. We need a, a church that is equipped to be a light, to be salt, to be those who stand, to be those who speak for the innocent, to be those who from the church go and apply God's word to the areas of society that God has called them into. And so we want to be effective as a church and we, we, we want to see God glorified in every area. Amen? Amen. And so we want to lean into that. So we're really excited about having him. So as we lean into this last message, um, God really has been dealing with my heart. It began this morning about, about 5 a.m., I just was sleeping and I, I just, I, I felt a, just a prompting of God's spirit. It was, it was almost like an invitation from the Holy Spirit that was simply, I'm waiting for you. That there was this engagement that he was inviting me to outside of the normal, outside of the normal interaction with him. It was an invitation. And so I, I, I got up and and decided, hey, I'm going to go meet with God. I went down to the basement and just began to, to read the Psalms and to pray and, and just and, and meet with God. And it, it was in that, that, that time with, with him, I, I sensed he wanted to do something this morning in us. He wanted to really, I, I think, deposit a hunger in us for more of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but we here at the church, we believe in the empowerment and the gifts and the, and the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit in every day of our life. We believe and we, we interact. 
and we want to engage. And, and this morning, as I was thinking about this last message, as we've looked at the life cycle of a church, a biblical life cycle of a church, is that we are a church. We believe that everyone should believe in Christ. And so we as a church want to make that available here. We want to also take that reality of the gospel to the world around us. And we want to do that intentionally. But we also believe that after someone believes and puts their faith in Christ, that God sets them in a church to belong. And so as you would be in our church, you, that you would belong here, that you'd have a place here, that this is your church family, that we wouldn't have like three or four churches that we say, that's our church and all the church. No, no. God sets us in a church family to belong. And it's in that belonging that we, we begin to, to, to shape one another and iron sharpens iron. And when we begin to fellowship together and get to know one another, this is important. It's a biblical model. And so we want to help people believe. And when we're here in this family, we want to help people belong. When God adds to our number, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to help them belong, to bring them into our lives, to help them on the journey. And as they belong, we, we, we also believe as we are belonging together, we also believe that God has called us to become, to become wholehearted followers of Jesus. And this is discipleship. And this is as we come and we hear the word of God and we're challenged and we respond to it and we, we allow the Lord to, to shape us and we're encouraged by it that we together are becoming wholehearted followers of Jesus. And that looks like something. And what it looks like is that we together build the kingdom of God together on this earth. And that is about being a witness, and that is about doing what God's called us to do in the areas he's called us to do them in. That's about us together accomplishing things. And, and we do all these things so that, again, we can help people believe, belong, become, and we build together so we can help people believe. And it's the life cycle that this is about multiplication. This is about we are called by God to build his kingdom. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but... God established his kingdom on this earth through the life, death, and resurrection, and work of Jesus Christ. His kingdom came to earth. Jesus said, when you pray, pray that my kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. But the work of God's kingdom is not done on earth. The work of Jesus is done on earth. He came, he brought, he established. The work of Christ is done. He is ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. But we are now tasked with carrying out the continual work and building of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so this morning as I was meeting with, with the Lord, I, I sensed this understanding that we are humans, we are ordinary, we are, we are faithful in the ordinary, faithful in going to church and faithful in prayer and faithful in raising our children and faithful in, in being a witness. We're faithful and those things are ordinary. Even the gospel itself is, there, it's, I mean, think about how God has chosen to save a soul that he takes a person and forms words and from their lungs, it goes through their vocal cords and this, this piece of meat between our teeth forms words that people can understand. And, and from that, people go, ah, yeah, I, I put my faith in that. Well, our words don't save them. Our actions don't save them. Then what happens is the Holy Spirit through us, through our ordinary, convicts the sinner and the sinner comes to know Christ and a person is brought from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's love. How that happens, I don't know, but it happens because it happened to me and it happened to you. That God uses these ordinary things. And I think so many times we as believers, as we begin to, to think about what God wants to do in his kingdom, we look around and we go, how is it possible because we see things with these physical eyes and we go, there's, there's no way. There's no way that God can change that. There's no way that God can change my family. There's no way that God can save our city. There's no way that God, we're, we are too far gone. There's no way. But the issue is then 
believers in church, what we do is we start making decisions on what to do through what we see with our physical eyes. But we serve a God who is at work in a spiritual world and invites you and me into it. And we live in a very, very, we live in a world that's so distracting. And so to understand this, this reality, there is a spirit world that's going on that, that is involving the Holy Spirit that is, it needs for us to be able to gaze past what we see with our eyes and see the solution of what the Holy Spirit is saying the solution is. So many of us make our decisions with our life without ever seeking the Holy Spirit. I'm guilty of it. We see things and we go, well, this is the solution, the logical way of thinking, and we make a decision, but we've never sought the Spirit. We've never sought a, an, an unseen world. And so when Jesus left this earth, he gave us a gift, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. I wonder how many of us, if we were to take a moment and say, how many decisions do I make in my life that is based off of what I see versus what, this, what I see God doing? Or have I sought, have I looked, have I, have I leaned in past all of the distractions, all the noise to see what God you're saying and what God you're doing? The apostles Paul, I mean, th look at what he says. This makes no sense, but the apostle Paul said it. So you're like, it must mean something. He says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Well, how do you see something that's unseeable? But the apostle Paul says it's important for us to fix our eyes on what we cannot see. In other words, we don't put our faith in what we see with these eyes. We put our faith in what God is able to do in the spirit through his power. We are ordinary, but it is through this ordinary that we must look to see to the extraordinary that what God wants to accomplish is something that maybe we can't fathom, we can't think of, we can't dream about, but as we lean in and we look, we're able to see it and then activate our faith and participate in it. The kingdom of God is built today on the earth through you and me seeking an extraordinary God with our ordinary selves. So many of us today are discouraged. We're discouraged, we're fearful, we've, we've fallen into doubt. And we look around and we see things with our eyes, our physical eyes, and we feel hopeless. We feel like the enemy is winning. We feel like, what's the point? And so in our discouragement, we can all do it. I do it myself. We, we can pull back and we step back and we go, what's the point? What's the point? Many of us can be like, the servant of Elisha. I don't know if you remember the story where Elisha is, this army is coming after Elisha and Elisha's in the city and the servant wakes up in the morning, looks out at the hills and he sees the enemy's army and he sees the, the chariots and he sees the horses and he sees the army. And this is what he says, oh my Lord, what shall we do? That's most of us when we look around. Oh, 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 Lord, what shall we do? And maybe that's you today. Maybe that's many of us today. And we're filled with fear, hopelessness. And when I talk about, come on, church, let's build the kingdom together, you're like, you're like okay, what are we going to, we look out and you go, oh, Lord, what shall we do? And then when we say, let's do this, you're like, well, that ain't gonna work. And when we look, when we look at what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come crashing 
through our lives into a broken, hurting world? Is there something more maybe we're missing? And I think, actually, I know there is. That we are unaware of things that God is doing just like the servant was unaware. Elisha prays, Lord, open the servant's eyes so we can really see what's going on. Then the Lord, in 2 Kings 6, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So there is, it's important, like Paul said, that we focus on what is unseen, not on what we see. Because many of us are just like the servant. We go, there's no way, it's over. Toss in the towel, Jesus come back. But God invites us to understand our mission. And our mission is to build the kingdom of God on this earth as it is in heaven. And I believe that God wants to make us aware again of what is unseen, of what you don't see today. That there is an unseen world, there is a plan and a purpose of God that he is doing through the work of the Holy Spirit on the earth. Many of us are distracted just like this servant. He was distracted by what was visible. He was so distracted by it that he missed the real story of what God was doing. Many of us are distracted by what we see, that we miss the real story of what God is doing and calling us to be a part of. And so, what if we as a church, instead of focusing on what is seen, it doesn't mean we don't do things about what we see, but we look past it in a spiritual way and we lean into the Holy Spirit. And it's hard to do in our world. It's hard to do. When we got social media, we got news, we've got all kinds of stuff going on, we got YouTube videos, we've got this happening and this happening, we got people telling us this is happening. And then all of our decisions, all of our prayers, all of everything we do, all of our emotions, everything in our mind is dictated by what we see with our physical eyes. But the Apostle Paul said this though, we walk by faith, not by what? Sight. So this is a spiritual work that you and I are involved in. And it's a spirit work. And so you and I are called by God to walk by something that we can't always see with our physical eyes. And we're to seek the spirit and what the spirit is doing. And that the effective kingdom builder is one who stops living their life by what they see and starts living their life by what is unseen because they've leaned in to the work of the spirit and their eyes have been opened and then their decisions begin to change. <coughs> Jesus said to his disciples right before he was going away, I want you to read this for a moment. It's shocking. But I, I want you, he says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Uh, excuse me. If I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. I, I don't know if I really understand what Jesus said here. It's to your advantage that I go away. 
Jesus was saying, so in order for you to build my kingdom, to experience the fullness of what I have done and accomplished on the cross, in order for you to see my kingdom, to bring my kingdom to the world and to allow it to grow in you, Jesus said, what you see, me, needs to go. And the unseen Holy Spirit needs to come. And the Holy Spirit will give you an advantage. In other words, you will be better off that I am gone because the Spirit will come and give you an advantage. So think of that right now. It is to my advantage that Jesus is not here. And it's to my advantage and your advantage that the helper is. I don't know if I believe that. I often say this, man, have you guys ever done this where you have, you're like trying to make some decisions and you're trying to figure some things out and you know, you're like, oh God, I, what, what, what do you have for me? And, I, and you think, man, Jesus, I just wish I could just like sit down and have a conversation with you and just ask you. Like, let's grab a cup of coffee and a falafel. I just, I want to have a, I need to have a conversation with you, Jesus. How many here have thought that in your life? Okay. Yeah, all of us. But by me saying that, by me thinking that. This means I don't understand or believe what Jesus said. What this means is I'm still anchoring my faith to what is seen, to what I want to see with my physical eye. This means that part of me is still walking by sight, not by faith. I mean, do we, do we really live like we have this advantage? I think most of us believe the advantage would be if Jesus was here. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go and the helper's going to come. I mean, th think about it. Here you are. God goes, physical Jesus, you see him, see his expressions, talk to him. He talks back. The unseen spirit that you can't see. Pick which one do you want? You're picking what you can see. But Jesus says, mm -mm. it's an advantage of the Holy Spirit that you can't see, that you cannot see. I don't think we believe that. I know in my life, I live many, many times unknowingly anchoring my faith to something that I've got to see. Many times we make decisions, whether it's for me as, as pastoring or leading us or our, our leadership team and, or in my family or whatever it is, I, it's, it's like immediate decisions are made by what we see. Oh, let's, let's find a solution for what we see. Let's find this. How do we reach more people? Let's find this. I, well, you got to do this. And here's the, you know, here's the consultant that says you should do this. And, why, and all these things are based off of one thing, living by sight, not by faith. What's the Spirit saying? Well, I don't know. I can't see him, so I'm just trying to figure it out on my own. What's the Spirit saying? And it's a decision that we can make, and it takes, takes this word right here, faith. This morning, I, 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 as, I, as I felt this Holy Spirit say, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I want to meet with you. I could have looked over and said, 5 a.m., I got another hour to sleep. 
I'm going to choose my by sight. I need sleep. But I, but, but I chose the unseen because I really want all of what the Spirit has. I really want to know Him. I really want to, to believe this is an advantage that I have in my life. And God's calling on my life for my family, for us as a church. I really want to see Him as an advantage I really want to see him the way that Jesus described him. This is your advantage. I really want to understand him. I really want to draw near to him. I really want to experience the advantage he offers me and you to know God, know the secrets of God's heart to know the truth of his word and to make him known on the earth. I really want to see that happening through my just ordinary self. I want this advantage, but I don't know if I believe what Jesus said. I don't know if I've, I've put my faith and actually that's true. Sometimes I feel like the disciples after Jesus ascended <laughs> this is one of my favorite verses. I don't know why. It just makes me chuckle. But Jesus ascends to heaven. It's like, he you know, goes up into heaven. Yay. And says the disciples stood there gazing. Like, can't see you anymore. <laughs> Jesus. An angel has to appear and be like, stop gazing. He told you. I don't think he was sarcastic that way, but he might have been. I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel like that. Like, Jesus, Jesus, I, I need to see. But he said, no, hang on. You need to seek that which is unseen. You need to separate from your, from your fleshly understanding of living by sight and start living by what is unseen. This means decisions are made that don't make sense to the eye. But we've seen past the army and we've seen there's chariots of fire that belong to God on the other side. So we choose a different pathway. The servant goes, huh? The man of God says, hang on. We're not going to respond to what we see. We're going to respond to what is unseen. It's a Holy Spirit relationship, the advantage that you and I have all been longing for. God's kingdom in my life, in your life, is experienced when we begin to put our faith in understanding what Jesus said, not by what I see, What I'm saying is this, is that Jesus made it clear, the kingdom of God is built first through seeking after and growing in a relationship and in faith with the Holy Spirit. And through that relationship, he begins to show you things and use you in ways and, and bring forth his power in your life in ways you never thought possible. John 16, 8 says this, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So this world that we are, we are called, Jesus preparing us, the body, the disciples, hey, listen, when he comes, he's gonna convict the world of sin of righteousness and judgment. And here's the deal. He lives in you and me. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you and me. And he is at work in the world convicting sinners of their sin, 
of righteousness and judgment. And he is doing that through us as we give an appeal to the world. We're not, this isn't some fleshly work. This is a spirit work that you and I are involved in through our everyday lives. So the more I'm familiar with him, the more I'm growing in faith with him, the more I, I, I cut through the noise and the, and the news and the social media and, and everything that everybody's telling me and, every, and I get with him and I get familiar with his heart, the more I am filled with him, more and more, understanding his voice more in my life, believing that he is my advantage, he is my helper. And as I come to share God's word with you and other places I go, I don't come and, and just think it's me, it's my personality, it's my jokes, it's my, whatever, it doesn't matter. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that he takes somehow God's word and he places it and, and cuts through all of our hearts at the same time. He ministers to us. It is through the power of that Holy Spirit that all things are possible if we will believe. So we do the faithful, ordinary things, but believe in a faithful, extraordinary Holy Spirit that his power shows up because we know him, we've listened to him, we've met with him, we've responded to him. We said, come and fill me up, fresh and new today. We see you as an advantage. And I need to grow more in this faith and what Jesus said is true. John 15, 5, Jesus says, Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So I, I want you to, to notice my job, your job, I don't want to call it a job, our invitation it's not to focus on bearing fruit because we can see fruit. Everyone focuses on what I see, what I see, what I see. It's actually to get to know the Holy Spirit as much as possible, to be with him, to meet with him, to rise in the morning and say, Holy Spirit, come in my life. I want to understand you. I want to, I want to know who you are fresh and new. I want you to fill me up. That we would listen to him and not be led by, by the army and the problems that we see, but act and respond to what he reveals to you through his word, what he shows you. That we make decisions based from the unseen, not always what is seen. And we seek him. And this all comes by abiding in him, meeting with him. Inviting him into your life. Listen to what is waiting for you as you draw closer. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes. Now listen, this is, this is, this is for you. He will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. So the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. Jesus glorifies the Father. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is, has come to declare it to us. Everything that Jesus knew declares it to you. Do we believe that? All that the Father has is mine, therefore I, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. What would it look like if I acted like that, that I believe what Jesus just said? You see, there are things in the Bible that are true. There are things in the Bible that we will say, yep, that's true, but we don't act like it's true. Jesus said, when I go, he, that's what, what this, he will come. So 
So again, this is for you. This is, this is for you. Followers of Jesus, this spirit is for you. In John 15, 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness. So this is this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that we are getting to know and growing in and, and understanding and we're able to know truth and discern truth and have the gifts of the Spirit and have words of, of knowledge and understanding and have the gift of healing and the gift of, of prophecy and to have this sense of that. We're able to view past what is seen into the unseen world of the goodness of God and we as his agents and ambassadors on the earth are carrying out works that are, that are not done by the flesh, they're done by the power of the Holy Spirit. In ordinary ways, through ordinary people, God's kingdom is built in extraordinary ways. This is what God invites us into. We're working with the Holy Spirit to bear witness about Jesus. And may God help us cut through the noise of life that keeps us so busy and so distracted. And may we draw near to that person. When's the last time you just, you woke in the morning and you just went and said, Holy Spirit, I want to know you. before we just took the, the script of what's happening in the world and said, okay, well, that's what's happening. What if we just say, Holy Spirit, what's happening in the world? What are you doing? How can I pray? Holy Spirit, I see what's going on in my family, but I wanna see the unseen. How can I participate with you? How can I have an understanding? How can I know all truth? How can you help me bring glory to Jesus through this situation? Our helper has come and he's available to us. If only we, we believed what Jesus said. We have an advantage we have an advantage. And I believe that as we lean into what God is doing in our lives, I believe this, my, my, my prayer is that we have so much discontent. It's the war in our souls. There's so much angst and, and it's, it's like, it's bubbling up in us and so we're looking on somewhere to deposit, like pin the tail on the donkey. And we're looking to, to find a place to go, well, that's you and it's this and it's my spouse and it's the church and it's my pastor, it's my, it's my job, it's my work, it's my this, it's this, I can't like this. And we're just depositing it everywhere. And instead of this fleshly discontent, I would, I would love God to give us a holy discontent that I'm tired of staring at what is seen with a physical eye. And I want to begin to engage in a spiritual world and build a kingdom that will last forever. I'm tired of, of using my emotions and my thoughts and my, and my relationships to feed the flesh. I wanna, I wanna give to you, God. I wanna be a part. I wanna know you, Holy Spirit. I wanna build with you. I wanna be a part of this inheritance of the Holy Spirit. And I wanna walk it out in my life. Instead of gazing at the army, I want to gaze at what you're doing and then participate. Be filled fresh and new. Starting today, that we would know him, that we would draw near to him, that we'd put down our 
flesh and we'd see into the spirit. If we can, let's stand together. We're gonna take the Lord's Supper together and then we're just gonna spend a few minutes seeking the Holy Spirit together. It's important we understand that what Jesus said, he meant. And he tells us to remember what he did. And so he did what he, he did the work on the cross so that we can now receive the advantage. Salvation, yes. But the advantage of the Holy Spirit to carry out the work of the kingdom on this earth. Listen, there's, there, there's two greatest, the two greatest days in your life is the one when you are saved. The second is when you understand your purpose as a believer. And that is to build the kingdom. We together. We aren't to, to fight one another. We're to have unity and build the kingdom of God together. That's what being a child of God is about. And so we, we remember what Jesus called us to and saved us from. So Lord, today we come to your table, the bread and the juice and the wine. We come, Lord. Lord, this bread represents what you've done for us, that you have you have bore the punishment that we deserved upon yourself, that through, through your stripes we have been healed. So Lord, we receive today, we put our faith in what you have done. We receive, we receive freedom from punishment. We receive healing in our bodies in the name of Jesus. We receive deliverance and so, Lord, as we taste this bread, may we remember what you did for us to prepare us for our mission and our purpose. Let's eat the bread together. Lord, we receive your healing. We receive our purpose. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup. So this is the blood of the new covenant. And so, Lord, we remember today that you have brought us into a new covenant. That the old covenant, your, the Holy Spirit would ascend on people for a particular task and mission and then leave them. But in the new covenant, that same Holy Spirit now dwells in us. And so you brought us into the new covenant through your blood, that you clothed us with your righteousness. And so we drink to remember. Let's drink together. I want to ask you this morning if we could just take the next couple minutes just as we worship just ask the Lord for more ask the Holy Spirit I want to just tell him I want to get to know you more so Lord over these next few moments may you open our hearts Holy Spirit we want to know you we want to draw near to you we want to see what you're doing we want to be a part we want to know all truth and we want to put our faith in the words of Jesus that we have an advantage. So we open our hearts to you over these next couple moments together in Jesus' name.